faithful and he is true. And he will do what he's famous for, which is to love us and to save us. I'm so glad that you are here today as we look into the book of Ezekiel in just a few moments. We're here to worship our Lord and Savior. That is what we're here for. If you will, join me in a time of silent prayer as we ask God to speak to us and that we will hear His words. Not the words that the pastor has to say, but the words that the Holy Spirit has to say to us. Let us pray. Last week we were in the book of Ephesians. We were talking about God's love for his children and how his love doesn't just stay right where it is. It transforms us. It changes us. It takes us from what we once were to what we will be. And there's a past, a present, and a future in that action. And as we serve the Lord, as we serve him and serve others, that love will be shared. Ezekiel is a very interesting character in the Bible. He wrote this, this book. Uh, he was a prophet. He was one of the major prophets, is what we call Ezekiel. He was a contemporary of Jeremiah. So we know about Jeremiah, but we also know about Ezekiel and how he had some, some wild tales to tell in his, in his book. And some people even labeled him as, as just crazy. But he was called by God to tell of the prophecy, to prophesy the message of hope to those who are hurting, to the ones that God wanted to show his love to. And God used him in a mighty way. Now many of you are familiar with the story of Corrie Ten Boom. She was the, a Dutch walk, watchmaker who her, her and her family saved hundreds of Jews from the Nazi Holocaust during World War II. They were faithful Christians. And in their homes, they, they, they were able to hide these people. They believed in the saving power of Jesus. They knew Jesus could save. And they saw the, the horrible actions of Hitler and his regime, and they began to live out their faith. In fact, over 800 Jewish lives were saved because they hid them in their homes, in the walls of their homes. In doing this, they put their very lives at risk. And eventually, they too were captured by the Nazis, and they were sent to concentration camps to be tortured. However, Corey was the one that survived this horrible abuse. And all during the, the time at the concentration camp, she never gave up hope. In fact, she is credited with this saying. She said, this is what the past is for. Every experience God gives us, every person he puts in our lives, is the perfect preparation for the future that only he can see. Isn't that amazing? Here she went through this horrible experience, and she still says, every experience is the perfect preparation for the future, what only God can see. Oh man, she was optimistic, wasn't she? She saw hope in spite of the difficult times. Now we all have times in our lives when we feel like all hope is lost. We feel like there's no light at the end of the tunnel. We think that God is not working. We think this is the most horrible experience we can ever endure. Yet Corey Ten Boom surely knew the depths of depression. She knew the despair of the Nazi concentration camp. When all hope seems lost, when we don't know how to keep going, when we don't even know which way is up, we must remember 
to trust in the Lord. Today's story offers us hope for the hopeless, turns darkness to light and defeat to victory, and gives life from death. Let's read together in Ezekiel chapter 37, beginning in verse 1. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath into you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you, and make flesh come upon you, and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come, breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know what, that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live. And I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken. And I have done it, declares the Lord. These words that are here are the words from the prophet that the Lord used to speak to his people so long ago while they were in exile. But these words are also important to us today. Parts of the book of Ezekiel are hard to understand. And as I said, some people said that he was a crazy man. They accused him of being schizophrenic. But we find through his prophecies that he's telling, he's telling of his visions that the Lord gave him. We find the hope for living for today. Now through his vision, some people see mystery and intrigue. There's futuristic uh, implications in some of his writings. But we see that this message, not only for those in exile, but for us today, gives us hope. When the hand of the Lord came upon Ezekiel, he had this vision in chapter 37. This is when the Israelites were in captivity. They were in Babylon, and they had been there for over 10 years. The promised land of their forefathers had been captured. The young and the brave were sent into exile into this land that they did not know. Their lives had changed. They were taken away from their homes, their jobs, their families. They were taken away to be assimilated into the Babylonian culture. You see, this king of Babylon, he was very smart in the way that he captured these lands. He took the best of everything from the country that he captured. The best of everything from Israel. He took the gold. He took, he took the artistry. He took the up-and-coming aristocrats. And he transplanted all of them into this world of Babylon. The 
His plan was to break them down, to transform them into good Babylonian citizens, and thereby conquering the nation from the inside out. So hope, you can imagine, was at an all-time low. Ezekiel and the rest of those in exile thought things would settle quickly. But those weeks turned into months, and those months turned into years, and eventually they were there for ten long years. However, through this vision, Ezekiel is letting his people know that there is hope because God recognizes their suffering. He knows that they are hurting. He knows that they are despairing. Ezekiel tells them that, that God is going to breathe life back into their dry bones. And he would rescue them from this foreign land and restore them to their homeland. And the Lord kept his promises to the exiles. King Cyrus allowed those refugees to begin to return home in the year 538 B.C. So Ezekiel's visions gave hope for the Israelites to hang on to even when they saw only despair. So the first point I want us to consider is found there in verse 1. When we are hopeless, God knows our future. When we are hopeless, God knows what's in store for us. Ezekiel says, The hand of the Lord was on me. He brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. This starts out as very despairing. But notice that God is with him. God's hand is on him. The hand of the Lord was on him. God was leading him. And Ezekiel knew this. He knew that God was in, in the midst of this. When he saw all these dried up bones and scattered across this valley, Ezekiel knew this must have been, this must have been the place of a horrible battle where these soldiers had been slain many years before. And then we read there in the last part of verse 2, where Ezekiel says, I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. This word very in the Hebrew language is transliterated as meod. It means exceedingly, to the greatest degree, this means these bones are the, as dry as they can be. This is the same word that is used in Genesis when God created humanity. And he looked at this human being that he had created and he said, this is very good. You know, everything else he had created, he said, this is good, this is good, this is good. And then he saw the human and he says, this is very good. This is exceedingly good beyond measure, to the greatest degree, good. So when we think about these bones being so exceedingly dry, we know that they are very old. They've been there as long as you can imagine. And there's no hope of life within these bones. They're dried up. What comes to mind to me is the cartoons when I was a kid and I'd watched Bugs Bunny. Bugs Bunny would often find himself in the desert, parched, starving, crawling to a, a pile of bones where the buzzards had already had all they could eat out of this animal. But Bugs, in his mind, he saw a feast. He saw a turkey or whatever that was so savory with the, the steam coming up. But we know it's only just dry bones. And when Bugs Bunny would get there, he was so disappointed because all he had was just dry bones, nothing to eat, no hope, all was lost. And when we are out of options like that, we come to the end of ourselves. And that's when God can use us, when we're at the end of our rope, when we say, I can't, I can't do it, only God can. And thankfully for us and for the exiles, God came to save the day. He came to rescue them from their situation. Look there at verse 3. The Lord asked Ezekiel, can these bones live? I'm like, 
What kind of question is that? If anybody else asked us this question, we'd be like, mm, I don't think so. We might be kind of smart aleck with them. But Ezekiel knew that God was talking to him. And he says, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Ezekiel was tuned in to what the Lord was saying. He was very wise in his response. And the word sovereign speaks very highly of what Ezekiel thought of the Lord. A sovereign Lord means that God has all power. God has all wisdom. And God has all authority to do anything he wants with his creation. Ezekiel is acknowledging, he's acknowledging that God is in control, that God is sovereign, that he can do whatever he wants. There's nothing that happens without God's permission. Does that mean that God brought about evil? No, but he allows it to help shape us into the people that he wants us to be. Did God intend for his, his children to be exiled? No, but look what it did. It brought them back into the homeland. It brought them to a place where they were willing to listen to God. The question for us today is, do we believe that God is sovereign? Do we believe that God is in control? Everything that happens in our life can be used in God's perfect plan for His people. We find ourselves in terrible situations, places of exile, when we're at the end of our world. Do we lose heart or do we look to Him? Our sovereign Lord has promised good to us. He promises never to leave us in defeat. In fact, Corey Ten Boom said, if you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed. But if you look at Christ, you'll be at rest. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Because he has won the victory. The next thing that we can learn from Ezekiel in the Valley of Dry Bones is when God works in our lives, we come to know Him better. We come to know Him in a deeper way. That relationship grows. Look there at the last part of verse 6. Ezekiel has already told God, you alone know. And God says, yes, you're right. And then at the end of verse 6, he says, then you will know that I am the Lord. You see, God wants us to know, to know Him. He wants us, us to know that He is Lord, but He also wants us to have that relationship with Him. The Hebrew word for know is yada. In English, our word know kind of gives us a, a, a shallow meaning of what it means to know. Yeah, we know lots of things. But do we truly understand? Do we truly comprehend everything that we know? We know the name of Jesus. We confess him. But to Yada, the Lord, to know him is to understand him in deep ways. To be one with him. To perceive his heart and his thoughts. To understand him to the fullest. Do you want to know the Lord? Do you want to yada the Lord? To know Him deeply? When we take our problems and our situations to the Lord, when we take them, our sadness and our hurts, the Lord reveals to us more of Himself each time. This reminds me of the story of a man who was walking along the edge of a cliff. And of course, he was a man. And you know, being a man, I, I sometimes want a closer look. And, and I want to see over the edge. And this man got a little too close to the edge. And the edge of the cliff began to crumble below his feet. And he couldn't get his foot his foothold. And before he knew what was happening, he was falling off the edge of this cliff. In a, in a panicked state, he was grasping for anything that he could grab a hold of. And about that time, he latches onto the limb of a scrawny tree that was 
sticking out of the side of the cliff. And it catches him for a moment. And he's looking around and looking up and he's yelling, Help me! Help me! Is there anybody up there that can help? And suddenly a voice comes out of nowhere. He hears this deep voice say, I am here. I can help you. The man didn't see anyone, but he says, Who are you? And the voice replies, I am God, and I can help you. And the man says, Yes, yes, please. Please, God, help me. I'm about to die. And then the Lord replies, Son, I've got you. Just let go of the branch. And this guy thinks for a minute, and he says, Is there anyone else up there? <laughs> you know, we, we're like that a lot of times when, when God has told us, I'm here, I'm, I'm, I'm catching you, I'm holding you. And yet, we look around, we don't see him, and we think, is there anybody else that can help me? We don't really want to place our confidence in God. We think, oh, I've got this covered, I, I, I want to help myself, or I've struggled all my life this this far. I, I found this scrawny little branch to hold on to. I, I'm surely going to save myself. But when we let go, when we let God take care of that situation, when we quit trying to do it our own way, when we quit trying to grasp for those little branches, we find out that God is a great big God. A God who wants to astonish us with His benefits and His blessings that are beyond our imagination. He did this for Ezekiel in his vision as he brought those dry bones back to life. God can do great things. He can take a situation that you see as hopeless and He can breathe life back into it. And I love the fact that God gave Ezekiel a part to play in this miracle. Look back there at verse 6. God says, I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. And as Ezekiel is prophesying, God is producing life, this flesh and tendons and skin. And then God adds something very special to all of this flesh and bones. This cherished breath. He breathes his life into them. Again, this reminds me of the account of creation. When the Lord had formed the man out of the dust of the earth. In Genesis 2 verse 7. It says, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. The man became a living being. We're not living until we have the breath of God in us. The breath of God gives life to Adam. The breath of God gives us life. And it also gives these bones life. And notice, God promises, then you will know the Lord. We will know the Lord. What more do we ask for than to know the God of the universe, the God of all creation, who loves us and cares for us? And when God performs these miracles in our lives, that's when we truly know Him. When God delivered the Egyptian slaves out from Egypt, they knew God. When God took out Goliath through that stone of David, the little shepherd boy, that's when David knew God. When Jesus conquered death on that cross and rose triumphantly from the grave, that's when the people knew He was God. When things seemed impossible, when things looked hopeless and despair was clouding the way. We see God working. That's when we get to know who God is. 
the author and theologian C.S. Lewis experienced tragedy throughout his life. And after the death of his child and the loss of his wife, he was searching for answers. And he wrote these words. He said, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our consciences, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. God is shouting to us in our pains. When we've been through these difficulties and these trials, when we feel like all hope is lost, trust in the Lord because He knows our outcome. He knows what's in store for us. And He knows that we will get to know Him better through it all. And the last thing that we can learn from this passage is when God puts His Spirit in us, we will live forever. Look there at verse 14. He says, I will put my Spirit in you, and you will live. And I will settle you in your land, and you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. God says, you will live. When he breathed his living breath into those bones, not only did they have life to live and to breathe, but he had a purpose for them. And the same is for us when he breathes his life in for, to us. Not just for our hearts to beat, not for us just to exist, but he wants us to live. And the word that he uses for live here is kaya. And that's more than just biological life. It is something, you know, biological life is all, we all have that. As long as we're breathing, we're, our heart's beating, our brain has activity, we have that biological life. But God has something much more planned for us. A full and abundant life. A restoration to what was lost. God wants to bring that about in your life today. He wants us to flourish. And when Ezekiel told this vision to the exiles, they not only had their hope for restoration of their old lives, but there was also the promise of eternal life, living life to the full. Over in Romans chapter 8, we read what the Apostle Paul said. He describes the same progression of faith for us. Romans chapter 8, verse 10 says, But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. We have life because of what Christ has done for us. Life for today and life for tomorrow. We are His children. And there's going to be a day when we're caught up in the clouds with Jesus. 1 Thessalonians talks about that. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians and told them, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. God is the God of miracles, and God intends for us to have life through him. When Jesus called Lazarus out of that tomb, we were given a hint of what he was about to do. Jesus was just days away from coming out of that tomb on the first Easter morning. Now Lazarus had been in that tomb for four days, and his sisters warned Jesus, but, but Jesus, he stinks, he stinks so bad, he's been dead for so long. But then Jesus commanded Lazarus to come forth. 
And in John chapter 11, we read this, these words. Jesus said to Lazarus, the sister, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? There is hope. Even when we die, we will live. Now when we're feeling hopeless, when we're at the end of our rope, when we are in despair, God knows that our future is in Him when we believe in Jesus. He's promised us a better life. He's promised that when we go through the valley of the shadow of death, He will be with us, holding us. He, when we place our hope in Him, there are eternal rewards. Jesus, our Savior, paid the price for our sins on the cross. He transformed us when we believed in Him, when we accepted His offer of new life. But if you've never accepted Him, He's waiting for you today. He's waiting for you to come. Perhaps you grew, you grew up in church and you've been a Christian all your life, but have you truly surrendered your whole life to Him? That's what He's asking for. He's asking for it all. It's time to submit our lives to God. Jesus came lived the perfect life, died on the cross, and rose from the grave triumphantly to show us the way back to the Father. Jesus knows all of our situations. He knows the despair that we're in, and He has hope for us. And this reminder of the valley of the dry bones is that God is working the impossible. He can bring life to death Hope to despair. That's exactly what we need. As we look to God, He turns our situations around. The Bible says, whoever calls upon the Lord will be saved. In a few moments, we have a time of invitation, and I'll be down front as we sing a hymn of invitation. Whatever your decision is, I want to invite you to, to come down. Maybe you want to come and kneel at these steps as an altar to God to, to lay your life before Him. I'll be down here wanting to pray with you. Whatever it is, I pray that you have heard from God today. Would you please stand with us as we pray? Dear Father God, we come to you today and we praise you and thank you for the breath of life that you've given us, the gift of your salvation, Father. We thank you for dying on that cross and being a sacrifice in exchange for our sins. Father, we thank you for speaking to the prophet Ezekiel about these dry bones that came to life, this miracle that was, that was accomplished through your breath, Father. Father, we ask that you breathe into us today, that you'll bring our dry bones back to life, that instead of despair,